Let's go to the book of James. That's where we are on Wednesday night. The book of James. And we're looking at verses 11 and 12. Here's what it says. It says, do not speak against one another, brethren. He's talking about believers. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother, I suppose we could say sister if you wanted to, speaks against the law and judges the law, becomes a judge of it. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and one judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. So who are you to judge your neighbor? Pretty good idea, isn't it? Now, notice my title of my lesson says, Speak Evil Against. <clears throat> uh, this translation that I'm reading from here, uh, it's a New American Standard. It, it's uh, of the languages. Really hit this right when he said to speak against. But the context is the thing where it's the idea of evil. I don't know, did your, how did your King James identify speak against? Yeah, it's speak not evil. It's kind of a standard translation of this word. I'll show you the word, then we'll have a word of prayer. The Greek word that's used here is the preposition kata on front of the word laleo. That's the word. That's a compound word. Kata is a preposition. Laleo is the verb. Laleo means to speak. That means to speak. To speak. Okay? To speak. Laleo means to speak, to communicate, to speak. And kata means against, against or down. It means against or down. To speak down to somebody. You know what I mean by that? When they say, you know, I'm in a, this position and I'm speaking down at you, uh, against you. And the idea of this word and the reason they've attached the idea of evil with it is contextually. But the reason that, and this word is used quite a bit in there, and that's really important. You don't, you don't speak down or tear down. You don't use words to tear people down, is the idea. You don't use words to tear believers, fellow believers, or anybody, but the context is believers, to tear them down. This is not your, you, the responsibility scripturally is to use words to build people up, not to tear them down. And so this is the word that's used in verses uh, 11 and 12. There's another thing that's in this context that's important. All right, we got this one? Okay. There's another thing here that's kind of important. The word law that's used in verse 11 is the Greek word nomos. Nomos. Well, what's interesting about this word is there's no definite article with it. This word is used four times. The word nomos is used four times in verse 11, four times. And not one time does it have a definite article. Notice as you look at your scripture in verse 11, when he says, or judge the brother speak against the law, they put a, they put a the English puts a the with it. 
and judges the law, puts another one with it. The third time, they have a definite article with it. And the fourth time, they have a definite article with it. And there's no definite article. And that's really important in the Greek language. It may not seem that important in the English Because even in the English, when you put a the on the front of it, it's for identity. And I don't know in the English language we pay that much attention to whether there's a the on front of it or not. But in the Greek language, it's this precise language. And when you put a the on the front of a word, we call it a definite article, it identifies what that word is about. Like for this example, if you put a the on the front of that, if you put the definite article the on the front of that, it changes to the person who is teaching it to the subject, identify the law, and therefore you're dealing with the subject of the law, and contextually you would have to go back and pay attention to that. What law are they talking about? Are they talking about the Ten Commandments? Are they talking about the Mosaic Law? Are they talking about some law principle? like leverite marriage, for example, or birth rights or inheritance. And what are they? So if there's a definite article, we're looking at a subject and context tells you what kind of, but we're looking definitely at what the law says, not how the law is being used or how you might view it. So that's a kind of really important to people who are translating the Bible or people like me who are teaching it. When there's no definite article, and we don't have one in this context, we don't have one time, then it changes from identity, what in the Greek, from identity to, to quality or character, like characteristics, character, um, conducts, and things like that nature. Now we're dealing with the more practical side of the law. And context, once again, is very important. We're not talking about the subject so much, but somehow the, the law is involved in what the problem is. So that's a, it's a bigger deal than it might appear when you're reading it. And so our subject tonight is uh, speaking evil or speaking against someone Often this word kata that I had up there, laleo, is, is often translated in the English Bible, and properly it could be backbiting. Uh, this word is translated in other, other ideas, or slander. It definitely deals with the sin of a tongue, speaking against someone's characters, about something about a person. It could be gossip, it could be slander, it could be backbiting. But it's using words to attack the character, identity of somebody. Um, sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. You still don't do it. You understand what I mean? You don't tear somebody down. You know, it's... The, I, that rather the idea is give people a hand up, not a shove down. Stop shoving people down and start lifting people up. Give them a hand up instead of a hand down. Uh, stop pushing people down. Stop doing that. And uh, so James is after this concept. He's after using, he's, he's in a discussion on this. And so after a word of prayer, we're going to come back and we're going to discuss that. That's why the translators connected it with the evil and that's why they're translating this uh, speaking against which is a correct translation they're saying speak, speaking evil against because it's an evil motive is to destroy somebody um, or to tear them down you know when you tear them down somebody it's to put them out of the game Whatever, whatever is push and shove is going on, you try to get after them and you attack their character, their 
IQ, you attacked all the things that are very personal, you attack them to take them out of the game. Does that make sense to you? And um, people use words like that to, to people. And it's about, listen, it's about who controls who. It's a power struggle. <coughs> and you either fight back and take, take the licks or you've just learned to be quiet and and uh, feel bad about yourself because that's what they're intended to do. They're, 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 uh, they're intended to cause you to cower down, to cower down, not say your peace, not say what's on your heart, not be truthful. And uh, if you were a child, we would call it bullying. If it's legally, then we call it assault. And uh, it usually starts out verbally and then goes to physical, doesn't it? Whoever's doing it is going to get control one way or the other. If, you know, if you're smart, you, you don't stay in that environment. Well, anyhow, that's where we're going with this subject, anyhow. That's what the writer's trying to encourage us about within the church. This is not, this is not character this is not blameless, above reproach character of the Christian life. We should be above reproach and blameless. And this certainly is not. This is not behavior that's not. So let's have a word of prayer. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it. You can't, you can't, you can't learn it nor live it. In carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude ten, sins or, as we're studying tonight, sins of the tongue or overt sins. Your responsibility is to confess your sin in whatever category it might be and what, how to identify it. You cite it, homo logeo, the word confess means to identify the sin and confess it, identify it and state it. The Father already knows is to bring it to your attention that it's producing carnality in you, so you confess it to get back to spirituality. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sin, you do it on a consistent basis. You don't do it at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. You do it all day when you ever necessary. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. What a wonderful, wonderful promise that is. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way tonight. Pray the Holy Spirit once again would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls that we might see how devastating this speaking against people's character in Christ. It's not the character of their flesh. It's the character of their salvation. We don't do this to believers. We don't do it. We just do not do it. There's no justification for it because they belong to the Lord. You take them to the Lord. You don't take them to the task. You don't take them to the woodshed. You don't tear down what Christ saved to build up is the point. And make that point to us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we looked at this Greek noun, nomos. It is the word for law in the Bible. I, I, it depends on whether there's a definite article with it or not, a definite article with it, how to be, be interpreted. And in our case of uh, James 4, 11, and 12, we do not have the definite article. It is emphasizing quality or intent or purpose of the law rather than identifying the subject matter of the law. And you'll see it used this way in our text. There's a hermeneutic principle for interpreting the Bible. There's a hermeneutic principle for interpreting the Bible from an original language into the present language, into the, into the present day 21st century. And, and I wrote it down for you. The meaning of the word, a meaning of a word is determined by its usage in context. And nothing could be more revealing about that hermeneutic principle that what we have here we don't have a definite article with the word it's the word law dominates the subject doesn't it yet the definite article is not with it 
And so that's very important. So we look in context. In the chapter 4, what is our context? It's th actually, it's things we should avoid. The whole chapter 4 is about things that we should avoid as Christians. Things that we should avoid. That's the whole chapter. The whole chapter is all about these things. Here, he brings a subject up that he started earlier in, chap in the earlier chapters of James about sins of the tongue. And so he's back with it this time, using the tongue to tear people down. Okay? And I, I make a point because the law is used four times. Not as a subject, but used in a in a, a way that's used in it in in uh, we'll look in verse 11 do not speak against one another brethren he who speaks against her brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law you're bringing in the law right you're bringing in the law as if you're an expert of the law using the law in a way and Jesus attacked this all the time, like in, in the book of Matthew, John, Matthew 13, Matthew 23. The Jews were doing this with the handbook called the Tradition of the Elders. They were, they were always critical. Legalists, as a rule, are very critical of people's behavior. They're just critical. I don't see how you could be a Christian and do what you do. Well, I like sausage. Well, you shouldn't be eating sausage. It's, I, I'm just using something that's crazy because that's the way it usually works. So listen, listen to this point. When you remove the grace of God, when you remove the grace of God found in Jesus Christ from the law, it becomes re religious ritual without spiritual reality. Why? I'll tell you why. Now, this is very important to our passage because Romans 10, 10, 10, 4 says, watch, Christ is the end of the law. Over and out. Why? For righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. People who try to use the law as a way of spirituality or salvation or other things of that nature have misused it, and they've become a law within themselves. They've become a law within themselves. That's why he says, and they become, they become a critic, a judge of the law. Look at verse 12 about that. He says, there is only one lawgiver and one judge, and you should be sure of that, because this is the one you will stand before of at the great white throne, at the judgment seat of Christ. As believers, we will one day stand before the lawgiver and the judge. Every Christian will in regard to his productive life. What have you done with the life I saved? What have you done with it? And it's going to be about carnality and spirituality and gifts and, and uh, divine production. It's not going to be about your salvation. That's, that's, that, done, that deal's done. It's going to be about the Christian way of life. What, you, what have you done? And a good example of how important this is to God is Hebrews 11. If you read Hebrews 11, you'll see how important your life in Christ is on earth. All that reward system in Hebrews 11 is about your function of of categorical doctrine in your everyday life responsibilities. You walk by faith and not by sight. You walk in the power of the spirit, not in the flesh. And yeah, 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 the, the, that's how it goes. Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 on your paper, Jesus said that I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. See, that's why he's the end of the law for righteousness sake. So I'm going to look at four things about evil speaking, using your tongue as a way, and then justifying your behavior by some kind of law. And the, listen, the legalist of Jesus' day 
they were they had worked this as a master. In fact, they developed a handbook to go with it called the Tradition of the Elders. They had they created it to make sure you you stayed in line. And they criticized Jesus because he didn't wash his hands before he ate. And that would disqualify him from being any kind of Messiah. Well, you're not qualified to be Messiah. You didn't wash your hands. Wait, where do you get the idea I should have to wash my hands to be qualified to be the Messiah? Well, we wrote a book, and you're not going by it. Yes, but the whole deal with water is purification, not blood. Blood, blood is where you get the forgiveness deal. Well, anyhow, that's, we still fight these battles. You do know that, don't you? We still fight them. Here's, here's my first point of four. Our lesson text opens with a command. Now, you can't see this. You cannot see this in the English. But when you read this, it says, do not speak against. This is really important. It's a present active imperative. That's a command. I wrote it on your paper. It's a second person plural. It speaks to all of us. And it has the negative may. See the M-E? That's not me. That's may. That's a negative that, that when it says speak, do not speak against. But listen to me. That's an imperative. That's a command. That's a command. And it's a standing command. And here's what that means. The, when it's in the present tense and an imperative in the present tense, an imperative, that's a command, present tense, that's continuous action. When it's with the, when it's with the negative particle, may, listen to me now, this is important. It means to stop this. Stop doing that. Stop that right now. Stop it and don't do it anymore. It's, it means to stop it right now. Stop it and don't do it anymore. Now, your life is going to go on from that day. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, this is Wednesday. I mean, you got Thursday, Friday, Saturday before we swing back to Monday or Sunday. So, Look at, he, he, and he said, I don't mean stop it just for today. I mean stop it from this point forward. Stop doing this. Stop it right now. Stop speaking. And, he, and that, that when, you, when you put it as a present, the, the imperative is a command. The present tense with may means stop this now and, and don't do this anymore. Don't do this anymore. Because you're tearing down what Christ saved to build up. You're tearing down what Christ saved to build up. <clears throat> Listen, the foundation is salvation in Christ and is to be built up, not tore down. We are not to tear down what Christ saved to build up. We are not. I don't care if it's your wife. I don't care if it's your husband. I don't care if it's your children. I don't care if it's your in-laws or outlaws. This is not what you do. That's how strong that is. If you're doing it, stop it. And don't do it anymore. I mean, stop it now and don't do it anymore. Now, listen, when you get a present active imperative that tells you stop doing something, you're going to be held accountable if you hear it and understand it. Did you hear it? Do you understand what he said? Stop doing it. If you're using your tongue to tear people down for which Christ died to build them up, you're in error. And you're to stop it. I mean, stop that right now today. You need to say in your soul, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing this. Now, you can't stop other people doing it to you, but you can stop do, you doing it to other people. Agreed? Okay. That's all he's talking about. And every person that's sitting in his class, he's telling them, you got to stop doing this. If this is part of your routine, if this is part of your pattern of conduct, you'd better stop. And listen, he's, listen, when you hear it and understand it, he's going to hold you accountable for it. So he says, our lesson text opens with a, a command to stop speaking against or down, speaking against evil, speaking evil against. Stop speaking down to others. I mean, who are you to speak down to anybody? Listen, Galatians 3.28. In Christ, there are no Jews or Gentiles. In Christ, there are no males and females. In Christ, there's, there's no rich and no poor. In Christ, there's no, there's not, none of these things that social society has are, are in play once you get saved. You're not black and white. 
You're, you're not educated and uneducated. You know why? Because the writer says we are one in Christ. The same blood that saved me saved you. It had nothing, nothing to do with educational background. It had nothing to do with racial backgrounds. It had nothing to do with social backgrounds. It had nothing to do with that. Same blood. The same guy who died on the cross was buried and raised on the third day, has broke all of these social barriers, all of these legal barriers, has broke them all. And we need to understand that in the way we conduct ourselves in the church with other people. You understand that? And if that's not true in your life, you need to stop it because you're wrong. Well, I'm educated, they're not. Well, I have a better address than they do. So? You cannot do that in the church because of Galatians 3.28. You cannot do that. Now, you can't stop it, right? But you can in you. There's one place you can stop this mess, and that's in you. Each person has to stop their own, their own deal, don't they? I can't stop other people the way they feel about me, but I can stop the way I feel about them. I can stop that business. Because, listen, Christ died for us, was buried in race of the dead, to give us the same salvation that he gives everybody else. And upon the foundation of the gospel of grace salvation, he wants to build your life up. And he wants to do it for everybody the same way. And we ought to be cheerleaders of that in everybody's life in the church. We should be cheerleaders of it. I mean, who are you to judge another? Boy. If you think you have a right to do that, you need to read Matthew 7, 1 through 5, where he talks about compound discipline if you do that. Compound discipline. You need to read that. It's well worth your read. Not now, but later. You need to be, you need to be aware of how God feels about this. And listen, the church is the, listen, when the church understands these things, we become a light. Remember, we studied the, a light amidst a crooked, perverse generation. We become the light. And listen what he says about that. We studied that last night, did we not? A light, and not only a light, but we're the light that holds the word of life. We're the, we're the light that holds the word of life in a crooked, perverse, depraved society. The church cannot be like the crooked, perverse, depraved society. We have, to be, we have to be reflective of the grace of God, and we need to be gracious to everybody else. <clears throat> We're to forgive as forgiven, to love as loved, and the list goes on. <clears throat> the list goes on. So here's what he says in, in verse 11, the first part of verse 11. <clears throat> uh, stop speaking evil against one another, one of the same kind that's in Christ, Galatians 3.28. <clears throat> Brethren, that's a vocative. That's a, that, listen, that's one of the 20 status privileges of being in Christ. We're all, we're all brothers. Listen, we're all, bro we're all brothers. We're all brothers, sisters of the same family. Listen, when you get saved, we're all brothers and sisters of the same family with the same father, right? He is our Abba. He is our Abba Potter. He is our father dad. He's our daddy. And that's true with everybody. And listen, God has the best for your life. And it doesn't have anything about whether you're this or that or this or that or this or that. You are one in Christ, and he has always your best interests at heart. And we should have that best interest at heart for the same people, I think, is our point. Kata Kaleo, 
is used by Peter in his book. And that makes it very interesting to find Peter, too, writing on this subject matter. It's in, it, he writes it in the second chapter and in the third chapter, and it is, and as well, he uses the same word, kataleo. He uses the same word dealing with the same problem. Because, listen, both these guys came out of max legalism to grace, and they're struggling their way out of it. They're, they're fighting the struggle to come out of legalism into grace. And Peter writes about it. Listen, all these guys that came out of it, all of the disciples that came out of it, Paul that came out of it, they all struggled with it. Listen, if you come out of legalism, you struggle with it. You struggle with it because it was built into you as a, a faith system, and it should be hard to give up. But it should be given up when the Bible shows you you're an heir. So it, this word kataleleo is used in 1 Peter 2, 1 and 11 and 12 and 3rd chapter 15 through 17, and it's used for not speaking evil against, backbiting or slander. You watch for these words because sometimes the English, they translate this same word kind of differently. And you want to pay attention to it. But it is used in those passages because, listen, it, our responsibility is not to tear people down in the church. It's to build them up, to encourage them, to nurture them, to help them in any way we can help them in their spiritual growth momentum. I mean, look, just, look, just to get you where you are today. Just to get you to where you are today, think about how many people actually contributed to, to your spiritual journey to get you just where you are today. I mean, you're sitting and you're listening to this stuff and you go like, wow, I've never heard this stuff before. Uh, I, I don't know whether to believe it or not to believe it, but boy, it's interesting. Just think, look, you didn't get, I mean, somebody several people helped you along in your journey to get here. I mean, I, I was thinking about this while I was preparing a sermon. I thought, holy catfish. I started writing down names of people that, that touched my life before I got saved, those who touched my life right after I got saved, those who touched my life when I was on a momentum for spiritual growth momentum, I mean, and listen, I, people still touch my life in dramatic ways. Uh, I had, I had two, uh, two language professors um, that touched my life in a dramatic way in, in the languages. Um, I mean, it, it, there's, the, my point is this. The church is a pretty big unit. We're, we're, we're a, we're a franchise. <laughs> we're, we're a franchise of the church. We're just a franchise down here. We got them all over, right? I mean, we're located here, and we're just a franchise of the bigger. Listen, we're all members of the universal church. We're just franchising down here. This is a local church. We're, we're franchising, I, for, for, for lack of a better idea. And, and people stop in, and they spend some time with us, and move on in their growth and their journey. And at some point, if we were able to help build them up and nurture them into their growth pattern that God has designed for them, they will remember us. We don't have to send them a card and say, did you forget me? <laughs> they could never forget you, even though they might have moved on. They will never forget you. Those people that helped you uh, in your spiritual growth momentum, just have a special place now. Do they not? Am I the only guy that thinks so? No, I think everybody. You go back and somebody touched your life very early in your journey. And, and, the, and other people, he brought other people. Uh, uh, he brought uh, a guy called Dr. Bertell into my life out of Arkansas. At a certain point in my growth as a pastor, he brought this guy alongside of me. And I was just struggling to get people engaged in local ministries and that thing. And he went, Ron. You know, Acts 1-8 says, go to the ends of the earth. And I went, oh, man, I'm just trying to get to the end of Alabama or Tennessee or Kentucky or someplace like that. I mean, for me right now, the end of the earth is just trying to touch every state that joins the state of Alabama. We're trying to send our guys out to 
And he went, well, look, that's good and well enough, but listen, you still got to push them to the ends of the earth. What are you, when you're looking out there, have you got an ends to the earth? You're looking good. You're, you're trying to reach uh, the states that border you and the counties that border you, but what about looking beyond that? And I went, I ain't had a chance to breathe, let alone look. And he said, well, you just ought to start. I'm just, look, look, doing a great job. And so he touched me that way. And I, I left that thing alone for a while because I, was, I just like had so many irons in the fire. And I thought, well, wait a minute. God don't give you more irons in the fire when he tells you you ought to have another one called foreign missions. And I went, oh, geez. So I stuck it out there. I stuck that out there. And the first thing I know, uh, sure enough, Billy Morgan goes out. And then after a while, then everything happened. Yeah. And, and, and I, when I think about foreign missions, I think about Dr. Bertello, my life and my ministry, and how this guy was just faithful. And he would just, he would just, I mean, he gets excited when he said, well, how many missionaries you got going? What you got going? I tell him, and he goes like, oh, <laughs> is that Ron Adema I'm talking to on the telephone? Is that Ron Adema? I went, yeah, yeah, I blame, I blame every bit of this to you. I blame it all on you. But. There are people that just touch your life, and I know you have them. You wouldn't be here if there weren't other people that touched your life to get here. And sometimes it's good to remember them. If they're still alive, give them a heads up. And if they're not, tell God you're thankful for them. Tell God you're thankful for them. That's a thing I do regularly, too. I thank him for the people that contributed to my life to get me where I am. I could have never got here alone. I wasn't smart enough. <laughs> it took a whole lot of smart people God had to bring a whole lot of people into my life to get me to where I am. And what this idea, this kata laleo, it means tearing down believers with words, tearing them down with words. We should always treat them with equality in Christ, no matter what our position of authority might be with them. I think sometimes we think we have a right to tear people down because we're authority over them. I had a wonderful pastor early a southern baptist pastor that was really good with me on this because when i was when i was immature in my faith in christ i would get a little bit i i was quick to kind of be judgmental about those who weren't out there just getting it i mean i was on fire for god i couldn't understand why other people weren't on fire for god that got saved and i couldn't understand why they weren't doing that and 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 i had a critical spirit in me and he pulled me aside and he went like, well, Ron, Ron, can't do that. And he explained to me how you have different, you have different periods of growth. You have baby believers, you have immature believers, you have mature believers, you have reversionistic believers coming back to the faith. It's just a whole lot of things going on in the church. And the last thing you need to do is be, have a critical spirit. And, and, and that was great advice. That was wonderful advice, and I, I loved him, and I, I took that to heart. And he laid some scripture on me, uh, like this one. Stop, stop, stop with that critical spirit in the church. You're to build up and not tear down. Now, that, was, that was good advice. I was young in my faith, and, and I needed to be challenged in that way. Um, so you have to be careful at parenting, like in Ephesians 6, 4. You have to be careful. You don't have a critical spirit in the way you raise your children. And he talks about that. Paul talks about it. And in Ephesians 6, 9, he talks about it at, on the employment side. And in, in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17, they talk about it on the national side of leadership, military, athletics, and, and, and government officials, and things of that nature. Okay. When you're in a position of authority, you have to be careful how you deal with people. You know, it's amazing. You can have coaches that are really good in X and O's. In, that, in other words, how the game is played. I mean, very good. I mean, brilliant people. Some win and some don't. And that's amazing to me because it's not always about X and O's because the players have to play the game. <laughs> it don't matter how smart you are with X and O's. If you can't get your guys to play, give you 100% on any given day, it don't matter. It don't matter how good it looks on paper. I mean, you've got to be able to coach young people 
you've got to be able to bring people and a good coach knows how to work his players. Good coach knows how to get them to execute uh, the X and O's. So it, it, it's and, and what's he doing? He's building them up and he's building them up as a team to think as a team and not as individuals. And and if he does his job right, these people will put they, they will not only pour sweat out for him, they'll pour, pour blood out for him. They'll put blood on the field. And uh, and uh, that makes him a great a great coach uh, if he can produce good people out of it in it. It's not just about winning games, but it's about winning humanity. Coaches have an enormous uh, they had big influence on my life. I know coaches, and I was a real fortunate guy. I had coaches that were after developing men. Good coaches care about that. They care about it. Good ones care about it. Well, my second point is the first warning. He gives two warnings. There are two warnings that the writer gives. The first warning is given to the believer who uses his tongue to tear down rather than to build up another believer. Listen to what he does now. I want you to say he's got two warnings. So watch this. In, chat, in verse 11, watch the first one. He talks about the sin of the tongue. He who speaks against a brother, he who speaks against a brother, or judges his brother, right? That's a sin of the tongue. And here's the warning. Say, here, here's, the, here's the problem, and here's the warning. He speaks against the law. See, like Romans 3.20, the law tells you what sin is. He speaks against the law and judges and judges law. See, there's no definite article. It sounds strange to say it, doesn't it, without a definite article. That's why they put it in the Greek language. It sounds strange to say it. He speaks, first warning, don't do this because he speaks against the law and judges. Speaks against law and judges law. See, he's talking in general terms, and he's talking about it right here. When you tear it down somebody rather than building them up, Christ didn't come to save you, to build you up, to have other people tear you down. And the church has got to quit doing that. The church has got to quit doing that. We got to stop doing that. You got to stop doing it. The, the Christian has got to stop doing it in his home. He's got to stop doing it with his wife or she with her husband or him, the parents with the children or the children with the parents. It, it, it's just... What does it cause? It causes enormous chaos. Does it not cause chaos? It, hurt, it hurts. Listen, when people who you believe love you dearly, quote, and treat you terribly, there's no worse pain in that. You know, I had a person say to me one time, you know, uh, I got married to a pastor said, for better or worse, my whole marriage has been for the worse. <laughs> My whole marriage has been for the worst because he, he, he always beats me down. Always beats me down. There's nothing I could do. I mean, if I, if, I, if I do everything good, it's never good enough. At some point, this guy would be good enough. You can't do anything good enough? Why, why is that even in the conversation of whether, whether I love you or don't love you? why we're in the game together. See, you really have to be careful. And so he warns against that. At Romans 14, 19, here's what Paul says. So then, so then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Listen, always be a peacemaker. In your, in your six feet of responsibility, you know that six feet we talk about where you, here's you, Here's your life, six feet, and you can, you can, you know, almost hand spanned out there. Not my hand span, apparently, because I can't, I can't even hold a football. But if you could hold a football, that's about what I'm talking about. If you, if you could palm it. Listen, he says, pursue. That's a present act of prayer. Pursue. That's a strong word, isn't it? Pursue. I mean, that's not, that's. 
pursue. <laughs> That's not quitting. That's chasing somebody, not quitting. Right? Pursue the things which make for peace. There's two things that you should focus on. Pursue the things that make for peace, not war, and for building up, not tearing down. Because who are you to judge when you know that Jesus Christ is the judge? Who are you to judge when you know he's the judge? And how do you, how do you bring peace into some place where there's no peace to be had? You bring it into yourself. Here's where you bring peace into the six feet. Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is the first one mentioned out of nine. His first one mentioned is what? Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, right? Who, listen. Right there, in that sphere of influence, peace can be brought to you. can get you calm down and get your proper perspective and spiritually minister to all those people inside that sphere where you're doing something that's going to build them up, not tear them down. Listen, when you tear down somebody else, it's just to build you up. It's your insecurity. It's not their insecurity. It's yours. Oh, please tell me. you By now, if you're over 35 years of age, you know this. I'm going to give you any slack if you're 35. If you're 15, I'll give you slack, even if you're in your early 20s. There's no slack for this idea. So the word is pursue. Did you circle that word? Circle that word. Now watch. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build up one another. See what I'm after? I'm after building up. You've got to pursue peace. To build somebody up. If you're at war all the time, nobody's getting built up. Everybody's getting tore down. So let's 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 bring peace into the sphere of influence. Let's bring peace. Let's bring God's peace into it. Let's bring God's peace where the focus is on Him. And then let's start building up again. Instead of tearing down, let's start building up. Then then He said the second word is the word encourage. Pericaleo. This time He puts it in a present active imperative. Well, the before it was an infinitive. Uh, it was an indicative. Therefore, encourage one another. You know, wh wh what are we doing now? We're encouraging by words. Instead of tearing down, we're encouraging by words. A and he puts it in the imperative. Instead of tearing down, encourage. Use the word of God to encourage other people to build them up. Listen, why not stop why not stop when you know that you've got war for come? Why not stop right then and say, let's have a word of prayer? Don't wait till it gets out to the point where everybody's drawing guns. Do it right off the bat. Go like, look, wait, this is not going good. This is not going good for either of us. Let's just stop and have a word of prayer. Let's talk to the Lord about it. And then let's come back and have a civil conversation. Encourage one another and build one another up. That's, and, and why would you do it? Because there's conflict going on. There's a warfare going on. And we're trying to resolve it. Listen. I, I can't tell you how many times. When Christmas comes, you know, let me tell you what I hear. I get a prayer list that you cannot believe because people are going to mix and mingle with their family. And they go like, oh, God, Ron, pray for me. Oh, oh, please pray for me. Because it's, it's the biggest mess Look, it shouldn't be because one person in there, it doesn't have to be a mess for you, right? It does not have, you don't have to be a player. You have to go because it's the right thing to do. It's your responsibility to be that light in the midst of a perverse family. It's your opportunity for Christ to be that light, but you've got to be that light. You can't get in there and start pulling a gun. But you, but you do have that great opportunity to be that light and, 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 and take some responsibility with it. And, and listen, they know you're the light. They go, oh, are we inviting her again this year? Are we inviting him again this year? 
he's going to bring that Bible and he's going to... Eh. Listen, when they know that you're the light, and they will, if you let it shine. Let that little light shine. If you'll let that light shine. Listen, that, that passage in Philippians we talked about last night, they will see that you carry the word of life and they'll be calling you. And next year, they'll want you there and they will want to sit by you and they'll want to chew your ear all day long at that meal about what's going on in their life. You know that's true. You know that's true. Here's the third one. Here's the third thing that you should not. You circled, you circled pursue. You circled encourage. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Unwholesome word. What is that? That's a word that does not build you up. Only such a word as is good for what? Edification. The unwholesome word, it doesn't build. It doesn't build. It doesn't build. It may not tear, but it doesn't build. So what they need is a good word. They need a good word, a word of encouragement. Pursue this idea. A good, only such a word as is good for edification. Now watch this. Here's the key. Watch this now. According to the need of the moment, not the not the need of the year, not a month, not a week, not two days, in the moment. The need in the moment. That's why you got to be on your toes. When you see the need in the moment, listen, for me, it's let's go to prayer, Jane. Let's go to prayer. Now, I wish I'd have learned that really early in my years of marriage. Nah, you know, the Lord will finally choke it out of you. Let's, for me, it's like, let's just do this now. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer because I can, I can feel in my spirit this not going good. I, I'm, starting to, I'm starting to feel defensive. That's a, bad, that's a sign you're going to flash. The fact that the inner dialogue says, I'm, start, I'm, being, I, I'm, going to, I'm getting defensive, that's a fact that, that you're defending the flesh. Nothing good's going to come from that. If you stay in that posture, you're going to forget it. It's going to be warfare. You, next thing you're going to, the next thing your mind is that, well, bring it on. Bring it on. Uh, bring it on. No, that's, that's not a good one, is it? <laughs> bring it on. And the next thing you know, <laughs> police are at your front door. <laughs> bring it on. So listen, the thing I want you to circle here, the need of the moment. It's always the need of the moment. Be on your toes. If you're spiritually mature like most of you are here tonight, you've got to hit it in the moment. Right there, hit it while it's hot, right in the moment, and do it spiritually. Don't do it carnally. Do it spiritually. Watch. See the word so that? See, that's purpose. Why do you do this? Why do you do this? So that it will, listen, why do I do that? Listen to me now. So that it will give grace to those who hear. You know, one of the things I love about Rick's report, because this is what he specializes in, is teaching grace. Is when he had come back, he gives a report. I listen for this. Those who have ears, those who have ears, those who have ears to hear it. Listen to that. So that it will give grace to those who hear. I mean, that's what you can walk away with. You want, them to, you want them to have the personal experience of somebody who brings grace into the moment, brings grace, brings God's grace into that moment, that moment where we could go either way. We could go into conflict here or we could go into peace. We could go to war or we could go to peace. We're in that moment. You go to peace. You pursue it. Listen, so that the need of the moment, so that it will give, so that it will give grace to the hearer. It will give grace to the hearer. They'll walk away having experienced from another human being the grace of God. 
the forgiving, nurturing grace of God. That's Ephesians 4.29. Let me wrap this thing up. The second warning that James gives to those believers is, a, is given to those believers who refuse to heed the command in the first warning. Here's what he says. This is the second warning in verse 11, by the way. If you choose to judge others with the sin of the tongue, if, but if, that's a first-class condition. If it's, if it's true, if it's true in the if part, is true in the then part. If he judges law, if he judges law, then you are not a doer of law, but a judge of it. And look at what God wants you to do. He's the lawgiver. Look, God's the lawgiver. God is the judge. There is no one else. He is it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, and that's God and his son. The rest of us, listen to me. James says, everybody else, everybody under the sun, our doers, not judges. So stop being critical and having that judgmental spirit about everything. Stop that. Because when you do it, you become the judge and you're out of position. One of the things when I was a football player in a ball game that drove our coat, our co I mean, you want to you set out a game, which you never want to do. If you earned it's too hard to get varsity to set out a game. If you wanna, if you ever got after a referee in a ball game, you could kiss your career goodbye, the coach I had. You could kiss a goodbye. I mean, I've seen him set all Americans on the bench in high school because they dare to attack a referee at there. And and I heard this, I've heard this so many times. He'd say to him, I'm the man who goes out and talks to referees. You play the game. You're not the judge. You're not the referee. And I'm going to teach you that. And boy, he taught it in ways you never wanted to teach you. And I've seen him set big, big guys, big, big, big guys down on the bench for a whole game when they did that. That's teaching, that's teaching some good lessons, you know that. Our guy would not handle that. You, you are, you're the player. You're the doer. You're the player. You're not the judge. You don't have the authority, son. You don't have the authority to do that. This game, when it comes to him, he runs the rules. You play the game. Whether, he, whether you like him or don't like him has got nothing to do with it. My job is to get after the referee, not yours. Your job is to get after the game. And, and that's kind of what he's saying here. Listen, you're never, there's never an occasion for you to be the judge. You're not the judge nor the jury. You're the doer. And so he makes it very clear. You are a doer. You are not a doer. See, when you become a judge, you are not a doer. You're a judge. You've put yourself as an expert that only God holds. He's the only person that holds the position of expert judge of the word of God. And so he, so he issues that warning. He issues that warning. Stay a doer, not a judge. Be a player. And so... In James 1.22, James earlier said in the first chapter, he said, prove yourself doers of the word and not mere hearers and quit deluding yourself. Quit deluding. You know what he's talking about? Well, verse 21, you ought to write that on your paper. What he's talking about, you're deluding yourself. In verse 21, he says, the word of God has been, has been implanted within you to carry you the distance. 
So prove yourself to be a doer of that word that's been put in you in 21. That word that's been planted in your soul in 21, become a doer of it. Become a doer of the word, not just a mere hearer. In other words, you've got to, we call that the faith cycle around here. You've got to, you've got to hear the word, believe the word, apply the word, and have God complete it. And when you don't put it through the faith cycle, then you delude yourself of the word that's been implanted in you. Here's another one, James 1.26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, there's no worse deception than that when you deceive your own heart. Then, see that, that if is a first-class condition, then this man's religion is worthless. This is where you get matai otis from, and it means to be empty of divine truth. Because you filled up that, that, that vacuum where the word of God should set. You've put worldly thinking in it. Cosmos diabolical thinking. And therefore you've been deceived because the devil is the master deceiver, isn't he? The devil is the master deceiver. He always has been. He deceived Eve right out of the, right out of the program right there. And so this is the word that's used for worthless. It means to be empty. Void of, empty means void, void of, of results. You got an empty well. I, well, I guess I can't get a drink of water. <laughs> no, you can't get a drink out of that well. It's dry. So that's empty. That's empty. So I'm going to let you deal with verse 4, uh, point 4. Okay, because I've ran out of time today. So I leave, I leave, ver I leave point 4 for you. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll release those on the internet. We thank you for uh, being with us on the internet tonight. Those of you that have come our way with us in the study of the book of James, we hope this has been at least enlightening to you. And so we sign off by prayer. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth a speaking against. Our job is not to tear down, it's to build up the body of Christ with the truth of the word of God being exercised faithfully through our life that it would produce grace to the hearer. Produce grace. That is our motive. Produce grace in the life of people. We thank you for all of this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.